where does art live in a culture? Where does dance live when it's not separated? Hello, my name is Leah Stein. And I'm the artistic director of Leah Stein Dance Company, and this is our home, the Art Room Studio, on the second floor of the building here in South Philly. And how long have you had your dance company? We're celebrating our 20th anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. On September 19th, 2021, I spent a lovely afternoon in South Philadelphia at an event hosted by the Leah Stein Dance Company. I even got to park, if not illegally, at least immorally. I have made many movies profiling visual artists, but Leah is my first choreographer. As a person who can't dance and has zero sense of musical rhythm, I was scared I would screw this up. But a fellow audience member helped calm me down. If you're going through something and you feel that anxious feeling, it's a false feeling. Phew, I can do this. So what is it that Leah and her troupe do? Leah and her company are known for modern improvised dance, which interacts with a specific physical space. One of the things about our company that makes it different is that it is site specific. That means that the dances could not be performed in another location and they're created in partnership with a particular place or space. It becomes an event where the audience is really incorporated and moves through a location. I actually love that. I love not having the ceiling on our spaces and that there's so much that's unpredictable. So if it rains, it rains. If it snows, it snows. And we work with it. In a piece we did along the Maniunk Canal called Return, I had hired a person in a kayak and they rowed down the canal at the end of the piece. Then there were two ducks that flew gracefully (laughs) and landed on the water. I couldn't have planned that and I couldn't have made a better choice. Leah may be the Ted Lasso of choreographers. You can feel her empathy as she shares her ideas with a group of students, many without any dance background. We just want to say hello. We are really thrilled to be here. We are just want to start with a fun game to get to know you and especially to learn your names. You'll learn our names. And we are movement-based performance artists. We are dancers, we, so we work with our... Um, medium is our, our physicality in our bodies. Okay, well, my name is Shay, and the movement, I guess, that re- represents me best would be this. Great. Okay, so wonderful. Thank you. We are all going to do the, we're going to say Shay, and we're going to do the same movement. So here we go. Ready? Shay. Yes. We do a workshop with all the people who are participating in the residency, all the students. It gives them a chance to experience movement, just basically doing, working with their bodies. Then we introduce the idea of improvisation and not knowing and that that's okay. And then we give them the skills of creating a site work. So the next step after the workshop is they go on their own, in their groups, to choose what site they will be spending the next week and a half making a performance. We chose the site because we thought that it was interesting to see how there were a lot of different levels and to see the audience's perspective compared to where we were standing. This is a really fun thing. I I never expected it to actually be this fun. I have always thought it was kind of weird that people just randomly do this. It's like a flash mob, but the cool kind. I've never really used these skills before ever. I've never had to look at a space and see how I could interpret it through my body and other people's bodies. It allowed everyone to be a part of it and like you didn't have to have like a certain skill level or like a certain asset in order to do stuff. At first when we got this project I was really kind of like negative towards it because I've never really danced before or wanted to dance before but As time went on, I kind of actually started to enjoy it, just being outside and like 
collaborating and making up our Ready? own dance steps and Work. just doing something different with a school project. Like, I don't think I've ever had one school project where they're like, go outside, find a spot, and dance. I believe my visual artist friends secretly hope that long after they have shuffled off their mortal coils, people will still be staring in wonder at their works. I asked Leah to talk about her audiences and the transitory nature of what she creates. I love the fact that a performance happens and then it does disappear, but it still lives on. I still have people come up to me and say, I remember that piece, it's still with me. I hope the audience feels very connected to the work and even part of it rather than a spectator. That's one of the things I think about is how to really invite audiences in. With site work, often the audience changes location during the performance and sometimes performers and audience mingle and move through each other. We did a piece called Portal on Walnut Street, an intergenerational work with four dancers from the company and then seven or eight elders, up to 92, who are part of that community. There was a whole range of textures and tones in that work. Humor and the whole life on Walnut Street going by, made to be part of the work. You've mentioned two pieces, Return and Portal. Can you tell me about some of the other highlights from your 20-year career? Wow, so many major moments in the company's history. The first piece we did outside, a big, large, site-specific performance in Fairmount Park in 1993 called Departure, included 30 professional and non-professional artists, dancers and friends, no dance experience, and percussionist Toshi Makihara and also visual artist Ed Dormer. That was a big turning point for me as I moved outside the studio and into the environment and started to cultivate the idea of movement and dance together, not only trained professionals, but being interested in how people move as well. We did a piece called Bardo, Abandoned Lot on Broad Street. It started before the sun set and it ended just after. So it was that period in between day and night. I thought that was a really special piece in how the audience was part of that space. They all sat in the middle of the site on stools and the performance took place around them. So they slowly rotated on their stools as the performance evolved covering a lot of distance, the road way behind, also on Broad Street, and then the buildings and the open lot, and then the objects we'd found in the site. There was a video of Ed Dormer's projected on the side of the building from the beginning of the performance, but of course you couldn't see it when the daylight was there. So gradually as the evening was coming, it just emerged and it was wonderful because different audience members would notice it at different times. I think that's something really key in my work. I think about making visible the invisible or even interacting with the invisible. A very special project collaborating with the Mendelssohn Club Chorus under the direction of Alan Harler, who's become a dear friend. The Mendelssohn Club Chorus and Leah Stein Dance Company commissioned Pauline Oliveros. And we did a major work in the rotunda at the University of Pennsylvania called Urban Echo, The Circle Told. I invited the singers to improvise through the foundation of deep listening and also to work with movement. They didn't have a score, no libretto. I invited all the performers to write a short story about their own experience of sirens because I had this experience of hearing siren, listening to choral music at the same time in my car with the radio on. And there was something about those two things colliding. And the most beautiful stories came from the singers. In the beginning of the piece, all the singers and the dancers are all standing throughout the space and the audience is invited to travel through the space, finding their seat. You could wander as long as you wanted before taking your seat. And they were whispering their story. So it was this forest of stories as the starting point to that piece. I had the great fortune of going to Japan with Roko Kawai and Hideo and Mika. We lived in a house for a month, this old traditional Japanese house, 200 or more years old, 
and created a work that was based on the stories of the house, the family history, as well as the architecture and the tradition of Japanese ritual. Gate at Eastern State Penitentiary, a very complicated project where the audience were given different color programs and then they were divided by the program colors into different groups. So the feeling of being separated from people you care about, the audience had that experience, just a suggestion of it as they were in this historic prison site and really mining the stories through some research and the dancer's responsiveness to images and feelings in the space. My mother is a visual artist and I did a performance in her retrospective in 2019. That was such a treat to be able to connect with all the influence I have through her work. In 2015, my dad died and I made a piece in honor of him. And he's a visual artist and his subject is industrial decay and steam locomotives. Has a very strong connection to landscape. Bellows Falls was the piece in homage to my dad, which is a Vermont train station right south of where my parents live. I was there with Michael and I found these metal tie pins and they have this beautiful sound when they cling together like bells, even a train in the distance. So those were integral to the piece and worked with Diane Monroe, the brilliant violinist, and Jung Woon Kim. made this trio in homage to my dad who loved gravel so gravel was key and I also got this metal bucket that really reminded me of my dad and that bucket has many lives and is continuing to be active in my work. I, I made a piece that I performed just before the shutdown of the pandemic, so February 2020, called Secondary Succession with that bucket and another bucket. I love objects making the inanimate animate. It was a whole period I worked with sticks in my early work sticks and branches, a piece I did called Timber, one of my early works that felt like a major discovery about working with objects. Battle Hymns was a big piece with composer David Lang. 80 to 130 singers, nine dancers. His music is beautiful, powerful, contemporary. Both of us were working with the ideas of war and the complexity of emotions, the tragedy and the sadness, but also often people in the military are proud and what that means. And not in any literal way, no stories specifically, but much more about the humanity and loss. Loss. Loss is a big theme in my work, I have to say. There's something about that that keeps showing up. And there's other things too, though. I hope a sense of joy and celebration as well. Leah Stein Dance Company has been critically acclaimed, but do you ever get bad press? And if so, how does that make you feel? Bad reviews. Oh, gosh. It was great, though, when you get a bad review sometimes. It may have been that outdoor piece of Fairmount Park, and they were really negative, but they hadn't even seen it. And they said just by the description. But the good thing about that was a lot of people wrote in response. And then a lot of people knew who I was. <laughs> Oh, well, that's funny. Is it safe to assume that money might be a problem for a dance company? Yes, it's very, very challenging funding a dance company. Capital C for challenge, capital D for difficult. 
labor of love, just determined to make it work and just great fortune to have wonderful people to work with. How have you guys been coping with the pandemic? As with everyone, very challenging time. We moved all of our programs online. I did work with the dancers over Zoom and made a film, even though I don't like being on the computer at all. But it was great to translate my choreographic impulses to a different medium. You've held this company together for 20 years. What's the future going to bring? I'm not in Philadelphia right now. I'm living in Vermont, taking care of my mom. That feels like a priority. So I'm focusing on the studio programs, fostering the next generation, giving space to young artists, and being more and more aware of the inequities in our culture and society. And as we move into the future with an expanded leadership team to change the model of the company so that there's a collective thinking about the programs going forward. The artists I work with, diversity has been very important to me. So rewarding my work, and I want to create the opportunity for others to flourish in their creative practice. Graciela Maialatesi is directing the residency for Emerging Artist Project. It's Reap What You Show, and we're looking to expand that in the future where there's cohorts of artists supported to pursue their creative process in ways that serve them best. Leah, thank you for a marvelous and magical day. And I'm excited and grateful and love the feeling of the event today, which was not so much about putting on a show as it was being together in community, supporting each other's work and different artistic voices together. Has a life in the arts been worth it? If you knew back then what you know now, might you have chosen dental school? I don't think I'd go to dental school. <laughs> um, I would do it all again. I love my work. I love working with people. Yes, it's hard and there's so many struggles, but so is life. I feel like my work is about all of it. It's all in there and it's very interconnected with my own life. So I couldn't not do it because it's who I am. I could not have made this movie without the help of Leah Stein and all the videos and still photos she sent me. Thanks to everyone who produced them. And here are some of the many people who have worked with Leah over the years.